Great to hear y'all sing, by the way. I was thinking a little bit as we were uh, singing that song of Colossians chapter 2, just before we get into Song of Solomon. It says this, regarding the reckless love of God, that when you were dead in your transgressions, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees which were against us, which was hostile to us, He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So what a beautiful thing, just to remember the initiative of our God. And I think just sort of side note before we get into Song of Solomon, uh, your God initiated in your life. He saved you, not on the basis of deeds that you have done in righteousness, but by His mercy. He took the initiative, and He still does. He's still initiating in your life. He's still working out this messy process of sanctification. So if you find yourself discouraged, just remember, apart from Him, there would be, there's none righteous, not even one. There's none who seeks for God. If you wanted to have a devo, it's Him. If you've ever wanted to pray, it's Him. If that worship experience gave you a bit of joy, that's Him. If you wanted to sing, that's Him. He is at work still to will and to work for His good pleasure. Uh, so let's jump into a Song of Solomon. I called my bride last night. She goes, hey, how'd it go? I said, well, you know, honestly, baby, I think I lost my place twice. I was scattered. I was all over the place. And uh, she gave me the, oh, oh, bless your heart. You need a good night's sleep. And so thankfully, I did get a good night's sleep. And so I hope that tonight is a little bit more logical, a little bit more thoughtful. But I do want to clean a few things up from last night since I was a little foggy. You mind if we do that? We talked a little bit about the qualities of the right type of person. And that's what I want you to, to begin to think about. We, we are not looking for the right person. It's not about Mr. Right or Miss Right. There's not one person for you. There's the right type. And we talked about qualities for men and character qualities for women that begin to show you that they might be the right type of people. All of those things, whether it's his good name or whether it's her um, submission and work ethic to her brothers and out in the vineyard, all of those things are evidences of something that's deeper happening inside. They're evidences of godliness. The right type of person starts with finding a person who is submitted to God. It's very important that when you date, you date someone who submits to God. Now, why is that important? Well, you probably came from youth group environments where pastors love to say, don't be unequally yoked to an unbeliever, so don't date an unbeliever. And I don't think that's wrong. I just think I need a little bit more information. The reason that is, is because we are followers of Jesus, we submit to God's word, which means the authority in my life is the scriptures. So regardless of what's happening in my life, regardless of the temptations we may be experiencing, regardless of the environment I've, I might find myself in, I submit to the word of God. That is my highest authority. So if you're in a relationship and you want to submit to God's word and uh, your boyfriend or girlfriend wants to submit to God's word, you're on a common foundation. You're pulling towards the, th the same thing together. If you date someone who doesn't know the Lord, they might be amazing. They might actually be morally better than many of the Christians that you've dated, okay? I just want to acknowledge that may be the case, but they're not on the same foundation as you. And there will come a point in time where that foundation being not the same, uh, you're going to pay a price for that. And I'll say often to folks, the only thing worse than being single and wishing you were married is being married and wishing you were single. And I cannot tell you how many stories that have happened over the 20 plus years of being a lead pastor now where I see a couple and they start dating and I'm like, ooh, do you know who he is? Oh yeah, but he's so nice to me and he's changed and he's different, but he doesn't know the Lord. I'm like, sweetie, I'm telling you, when push comes to shove, he won't submit to what you submit to in the Word of God. He'll find a way out, and it happens all the time. So when we're talking about the right type of person, we're talking about somebody who's a follower of Jesus. And I say follower of Jesus different than just being a Christian. A lot of people can say they're Christian. You want somebody who's following Jesus. And then your focus in the attraction sort of phase is not looking for the right type of person as much as becoming the right type of person. Like begets like. Like attracts like. So if you are uh, on a scale of zero to 10 in terms of maturity, if you're a two, don't ever expect a 10 to want to spend time with you. 
because the reality is they're going to sniff out your immaturity, all right? Um, and so the best gift you can give to, the, to your future self is right now invest in the lonely work that no one else will see but you and the Lord and become the right type of person. And as you do that, you can develop what I call, it's a fancy, I made it up, so I mean, it, it sounds fancy, but it's pretty simple. I call it a theology of relationship. And so what are the things that you hold in a closed hand about the person you're looking for? Okay, so like for me in the closed hand, they've got to love Jesus. They've got to follow him. For me, because I knew I wanted to be in ministry, they've got to be willing to be a pastor's wife, which means they've got to be willing to open their home. Now, I had no idea what I was getting into with my wife, who would open it to all of you right now. Let's all go to, her house, to our house and we'll have dinner. But these are the things I held with a, with a closed hand. You need to develop a theology of relationship. What are the things that are in your closed hand? Now, word of caution, not everything belongs in a closed hand. Physical attributes don't belong in the closed hand. Well, I want someone who's blonde and who's tall and who has a nice car. Those can be in your open hand, okay? But just keep in mind, the things that are in your open hand, they're, they're given to God. And so don't be surprised if God's like, yeah, I know that's what you wanted, but I'm going to give you something else. And so develop a little bit of a theology of relationship. What type of person do you want? I knew in my life, I have a tendency to be a little too serious. So I needed somebody who had a good sense of humor and was fun. And the Lord provided that. You've got to know who you are, like who you are, be who you are, and then understand what type of person or what character traits in that open hand would enhance your relationship. Okay? So, and, and, and if you can find those things in the right type of person who's got what you need in the closed hand and some of the open-handed things, then perfect. That's the type of person you know you need to pursue. Here's what that will do for you. It, in this season, it changes the focus from the person to what about that person. So instead of, oh, I have feelings for, you know, so-and-so, it's like, no, what is it about so-and-so that makes me interested in them? Well, I like the way they laugh. Okay, we'll write that down. I like that they tell a good story. Okay, write that down. I like that they, I don't know, whatever. Write that down. Could be a thousand things, which means this is a wonderful environment because there's probably something in every single person here that you can say, I like that about them. Great. That's different than I like them. As soon as you say, I like them, you're, you've missed the point. But if you say, I like that about them, okay? Um, I'll tell the story. I'll tell the story later, so I'll hold it for now. Does that make sense, though? Closed-handed issues that are non-negotiables for you, open-handed issues, that's what we meant to say with attraction. Make sense? All right, let's watch this couple begin to date. A couple things about dating. The reason I want to walk through this is because I'm just convinced that we are creating uh, an institution that is not helpful for us. So media, TV, music, film, highly sexualized culture. Uh, we've got celebrity obsession. Um, the language of dating is purposely ambiguous. It's almost as if it's designed to create as many of the perks as possible with as few of the responsibilities as possible. Um, I mentioned the language last night and felt really old, you know, talking about what, what do the kids talk about with a dating relationship. But the language changes over time. Like the blessies when they dated, the language was probably different. Did you guys maybe go steady? Yeah, so going steady was a thing. When I was a kid, they talked about going around. Like, I don't even know what that means anymore, but that's what we did. But now if you think about it, how many times have you seen a couple start to kind of couple up and you go, oh, are you guys dating? And they go, oh, no, we're just talking. Or, no, we're just texting. Or no, we're just whatever, right? And the point is, it's, it's vague. And what I would really like to do is give you some common language. Common language that if you'll understand what dating is, live out what dating is versus what seriously dating is, which we'll cover tomorrow night, I think you can save yourself a lot of heartache. And the other thing is, as we're talking about being attracted to the right type of person, um, as you begin to attract to the right type of person, and then you begin to spend time with them, what you're going to find is the game is going to begin to change a little bit. And things will shift from just a date to now dating, and the rules change to prepare you for a different type of relationship. Here's one of the problems that's happening. In a relationship, there are three aspects to a relationship, any relationship that you're in. There's an emotional aspect, there's a spiritual aspect, and there's a physical aspect. 
Emotionally, that's pretty self-explanatory. This is where you're sharing what you love, you're sharing your passions, your fears, your concerns, you're communicating at a deeper level. Can I just give you a little bit, this makes me feel a little bit like a dad, but a little bit of advice that texting is really not a good way to communicate, that there's just nothing like a voice and there's really nothing like a face. And so the, if you want to, to develop a healthy relationship, have the conversation. Now, honestly, from a maturity standpoint, in, if you just read sociology books in general, women tend to be far more mature at an earlier age than men are. Uh, but men, that's no excuse. We've got to learn how to communicate and share our heart. The reason I say that is because those three aspects of a relationship, emotional, uh, spiritual, and physical, slide on a scale from shallow to intimate. So you meet somebody, you start spending time together. Next thing you know, you're like on the phone or texting till 2 a.m. You're sharing what you're fearful of, what you love, what you're passionate about. You're sharing your testimony, your life story. I read this passage. I read that passage. This is amazing. Isn't God good? You're sharing, and so intimacy is happening. Now, emotional intimacy, okay, we, we need to be careful, but it's not catastrophic. Spiritual intimacy. I'm not a fan in a dating context of spiritual intimacy. I, I just don't think you need to be having a quiet time with your girlfriend or boyfriend. I don't think you need to be reading a book together. I think if anything, you're wanting to watch them to see if they'll do it without you. Because if they don't do it without you, they're going to be dependent on you for the rest of your relationship, and that's exhausting. But from a spiritual standpoint, I would be careful even with that. I, I wouldn't encourage you to pray with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Why? Because that's not your spouse yet. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the way we're looking at relationships. Instead of saying, how intimate can I be? I want to ask you, how much intimacy can you hold off from so that when you get married, you can share it all? Okay, the, because the third aspect, the physical, what we don't realize is that all three of these elements, the emotional, spiritual, and physical, are connected like links in a chain, which means you can't be talking emotionally like, I love you, I've always wanted to meet somebody like you, how many kids do you want, man, we should get married, which some people talk about. And then the spiritual is going with it. Oh man, this is great, we're going to church, let's pray together, isn't this wonderful? and then expect that the physical will stay shallow. So if you cross physical boundaries, first thing I'm gonna ask you is tell me about your emotional intimacy. I guarantee it's off the chart. Your spiritual intimacy is off the chart. So of course you struggle physically. So if you want to not struggle physically, the answer is not boundaries. Like, well, nothing coming off, like I said last night, nothing laying down, nothing below the neck. Okay, that, that doesn't help at all, honestly. Paul talks about that, by the way, in Colossians. He says, um, we have rules like don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. He said, these things seem like they're wise. Uh, he said, but they have no earthly value in the battle of fleshly lust. Because we're just like hackers and we'll work our way around it, okay? If you want to have uh, a, a relationship where you don't cross physical boundaries, then don't cross emotional boundaries. And don't cross spiritual boundaries. And then the physical is going to stay right there. Does that make sense? You with me on that? So this is, uh, this is some of the things to think about as we head into a dating relationship. What happens if you're not mindful of that and if you embrace the cultural view that intimacy is actually a good thing? Well, if that's the case, then you throw aside biblical wisdom and you pursue emotional intimacy, spiritual int intimacy, and physical intimacy. You're not now in a dating relationship. You're in something that looks a lot like a marriage. And the problem with that is in that dating relationship, because you're not married, which means there's an easy out for either one of you, then when you experience a breakup because you don't like the way he laughs or she chews her food like a horse or whatever, he smells, okay, whatever that issue is, trivial or significant as it may be, now you break up. You didn't just break up, you experienced a divorce because you've given yourself to this person emotionally, you've given yourself to this person spiritually, you've given yourself to this person physically. Now, you would think we'd learn our lesson. Like when you were a kid and you touched the hot stove and it just burned the snot out of your hands, as a kid, you're like, okay, I ain't doing that. You would think as it relates to relationships, we would learn like that, we don't learn like that. So if you've had a relationship that's been off the charts emotionally, spiritually, and physically, 
and you broke up. You experienced that feeling of divorce, crying yourself to sleep on your pillow. I mean, just begging for death because you're just destroyed, right? It's awful. And so you'd think you'd say, I'm never doing that again. But if you're attracting for the wrong reasons, then you're not looking for the right type. You're looking for who looks good on the outside. You see them and without wondering or finding out what their character's like, you give them your number or your snap or whatever. Now you're connecting with them. Now you're intimate with them. Now you did it again. And as a fool returns to its vomit, that's what happens. Or a dog rather who turns to its vomit is a fool who returns to its folly. You did it again. And we don't learn our lesson. And so we, uh, we end up jumping back into a relationship when we do it over and over and over. And that, that is more than a breakup, okay? And so when you play that out, the other thing that's happening, by the way, is if what we're doing in an attraction or a dating context is training ourselves for future relationships, either that one or another, we're actually training ourselves for divorce. Because what we're saying is, I'm attracted to you based on whatever superficial issue, I'm willing to get emotionally, spiritually, and physically intimate with you until it doesn't work out, and then we'll break up, and yes, it'll suck, and yes, I'll cry a little bit, uh, but then I'll just find somebody else and I'll do it again. You're training yourself for the back door, which is why the divorce rate in churches is not very different than it is outside of the church, because we're, we're not training ourselves for healthy relationships, and that's happening uh, over and over and over. And so if you just envision your life like a, like a rose, and so your emotional, spiritual, and physical intimacy is like the beautiful petals of that rose, but if you get into a relationship and you give yourself away, you break up, date someone else, give yourself away, give yourself away, at some point, you got nothing left. So what I'm advocating for is whatever you have left, because by the way, some of you have given yourself away a lot. Some of you, not at all. Regardless of what you have left, can each and every one of us, with whatever is remaining, say, you know what? Not again. I I'm going to do it different. I'm going to protect what I've got for my spouse. And whatever emotional, spiritual, or physical intimacy that I still have, I'm going to have now maybe a second first time. I'm going to hold what I've got and wait for that spouse. Now, honestly, it's hard. You know why? Because we're emotional junkies. Or excuse me, intimacy junkies. We like it, we want it, but there's gotta be a better way. Because if we're in Christ and the Bible is informing how we handle relationships, then we've got to see if maybe there's a way to do this to where that doesn't happen. Jeremiah chapter six, verse 16 speaks of the old ways. It says, stand by the ways and see, ask for an ancient path where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. That's what we're looking for. We wanna go find the old ancient ways and what is might provide for us rest for our souls. Now, before we watch this couple date, somebody read verse seven for me there. So remember, we just de dealt with attraction. We saw them beginning to, um, you know, be interested in one another. Verse six, she says, don't stare at me because I'm sunburned because of her brothers who put her to work. Look at verse seven. Somebody read that. I want to ask and answer a question that might feel a little old-fashioned, but stay with me for a second. I, I think it might be relevant. Is it, is it okay for a girl to initiate with a boy? Is it okay for a girl to call the boy, to ask the boy out, to initiate with him, to go up to him and give him her number? Um, it's an interesting question because it seems like in verse 7, she's like, hey, where are you going to be? Because wherever you're going to be, I think I kind of want to be there. And so it almost looks like she's initiating with him, but I, I want to suggest that, that she's not. And, and here's why. Um, in my opinion, I do not recommend you girls initiating with a boy. And that feels really old-fashioned. And my girls, we've had long conversations about this. But here's why. You're developing patterns. One of the patterns that's happening right now is in a prolonged adolescence, specifically as it relates to boys. And so what you've got now, adolescence, by the way, was never a thing like a generation ago. Nobody's even talking about it, or maybe two generations ago. But now we're having to talk about adolescence. What is that? Well, it's like where you're kind of a kid, but kind of not. 
You kind of should be a, an adult, but you're still living with mom. You probably should have a job, but you're really worried about your Xbox scores. Like something's wrong with this picture, okay? It's, it's a prolonged boyhood. And so one of the things that will happen, ladies, if you initiate with him, is if you initiate, he, he'll never have to. Which means in some ways, you're not going to become his girlfriend, you're going to become his mom. And just like mom is taking care of him and mom is doing his laundry and mom is cooking his food and mom is making sure he's got his clothes laid out and mom's doing all this stuff, you're going to be mom and you don't want that. And I know for some of you caretaking ladies, that sounds really like, oh, no, I'd love to take care of him. Yeah, that, that'd be fine for about two days. And then while you're working and he's at home sitting on the couch watching NFL Red Zone unemployed and you're picking up a second shift, to pay for his chip-eating, sorry butt. Sorry, did I get upset right there? Yeah, I felt like it came out. You're going to be very frustrated with that. So remember, you're creating patterns. You're creating patterns. And so one of the things I would suggest is, ladies, uh, let him lead. In fact, force him to lead. And the way you force him to lead is don't make it easy for him. Don't do it for him. Because what's happening now, especially with cell phones, okay? With cell phones, we're, we're waiting for... That real easy, like, hey, you know, guys will be like, hey, can I get your snap? Like, that's, that's not asking a girl out, okay? That's junior high stuff. But we do that kind of thing. And one of the things you ladies can say is, no, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. Or whatever, right? But just make him lead. And we mentioned this here a little bit this morning. I'm really a proponent of manhood. And, and what I mean by that is not, as I said, it's not that you have to wear camo and gut, you know, a deer out in the field. It's not what I'm talking about. You don't need to drive a four by four truck that's all jacked up or rodeo on the weekends. What you need to do is reject passivity, accept responsibility and lead courageously. Gentlemen, it is time that we raise the bar for manhood and do those three things. And I will tell you this, fellas, I would imagine if you did something stupid in your life that you regret, okay? It probably came from a violation of one of those three or a combination thereof. Reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously. For example, if let's say you've got um, KP duty tomorrow at 8, okay, and you show up at 8.30, uh, it's not your alarm's fault that you're late. So don't say, oh, my alarm didn't go off. No, your alarm goes off when you set it correctly. If you set it correctly, it would have gone off. Well, my phone died. Yeah, and if you would have plugged it in, it would have been, that's a you problem. So don't blame someone else. We've got to begin as men to accept responsibility. I'm sorry, I'm like, that's on me. That is my fault, right? And, and to end that, reject passivity, accept responsibility, and lead. So ladies, if you initiate, the problem is you'll always have to. I'll give you a real life example. His name was Bill Nixon. And Bill's daughter, Casey, I was really into in high school. I thought she was amazing. So back in the day when landlines were a thing, I called the house and Mr. Nixon answered. I said, Mr. Nixon, this is Brad Bell. I'd love to talk to Casey. He says, oh, Brad, she's not here right now. I said, hey, no problem. Would you just have her call me back when she gets in? He goes, oh, she didn't tell you? I go, what's that? She goes, oh, my daughter doesn't call boys. And I remember I was like, <laughs> this is so stupid. Okay, that's great. I'll call back. I'm like, this is so dumb. He's brilliant. Because what he was making me do is be a man. Well, ladies, the problem is you have the cell phone in your pocket and if you were my daughter, I can't protect you because he got your number and he's texting you. And I can't be the one to be a Mr. Nixon in your life. By the way, Mr. Nixon passed away about a year ago. I did his funeral. His daughter Casey and her husband were there. I told that story. So grateful for his influence in my life. He showed me what it means for a dad to be that protector for his daughter. But ladies, we're in a culture now where you have that phone and there is no protector. You've got to value yourself enough respect yourself enough that you wait for him to call. And you say, well, what if he doesn't call? Then he's not the right type of guy. He's a boy. He's a boy. If he won't initiate with you, he's a boy. And do you want to date a boy? No. Now, none of these guys would do that. These guys would initiate. But let's say he doesn't. Then he's a boy. You don't want that. Because again, you're creating patterns. Because when you get married, Who's the spiritual leader of your home? He is. But if he never has been, then he never will be. Chances are. So if he's not willing to lead as a single, then he's not going to be prepared to handle you as a husband. 
if he's not willing to initiate as a single guy in a dating relationship, then he's not prepared to be a husband. Does that make sense? Which is why, and we'll talk about maturity here a little bit, um, maybe after the end of this one or tomorrow. Um, you, you've got to make sure you're dating someone who's got the maturity to handle a relationship, especially if it goes to the next level. We'll talk here in just a second about the definition of dating in, in which the, I think there's a little bit of freedom, but uh, I think in, as, it, as it relates to a relationship maturing, you've got to make sure you've got a man who can handle that maturity. And so ladies, that simply means you get to be the prize. I tell my girls all the time, guard your heart. You're the treasure. Make him work for it. Make him initiate with you. Make him call you. Force him to lead. Guard your heart. Um, my uh, oldest, she went to Clovis North, and the first dance they did her freshman year was Sadie Hawkins. What do you think I said to that? I'm going to go with no on that. I'm going to have you as an early teenage girl inviting some boy to a dance right out of high school or right in. No. By the way, do you know what Sadie Hawkins came from? It came from a cartoon of a homely girl who couldn't find a suitor. So her dad orchestrated a holiday in her honor to help her find a man. There was a foot race and the loser married Sadie. And we do Sadie Hawkins in the high schools. Stupid. So I would just say, look, uh, make him take the initiative, make him lead. Now, back to verse 7. But is it wrong, ladies, for you to put yourself in the place where you're going to be where he is? That, I would say, absolutely not. Do that. That's okay. So look, if he works in the snack shop and you want to go get another milkshake, totally do it. If he's a lifeguard and you find that you're all of a sudden into swimming, totally fine. Okay? Um, if you hate middle school kids, but he's going to be a lead this summer at Meadow, then you love middle schoolers. No problem whatsoever. Put yourself in the place where godly people are. I'll, I'll tell you a true story. So we had a coffee shop uh, when I was in Texas that our college ministry operated. My responsibility, is, as well as Mike Sladen, who's one of our teaching guys, um, back in the day he was a, high school, or a college student, my job with the guys was to clean up the, co the coffee shop. It's called the cup. And so we do an event, and everybody would leave, and all the guys would lock the doors, turn on some music, be dudes, fart, clean up, have a good time, just the boys being the boys. And then all of a sudden, this, this girl, name was Jennifer Zebron, everybody called her Z, Z showed up, and she always had like these, you know, like three or four hummingbirds around her, like all these girls she was discipling or mentoring. She showed up to the, to the cup, and she goes, well, can we help you guys? And we're like, well, I mean, it kind of ruins the fun a little bit, you know, because, you know, you can't. You can't act like an idiot. So I'm like, yeah, sure. And so anyway, we'd start hanging out and cleaning up. Next thing you know, the music's on. We're dancing. Next thing you know, she and I are dancing. And she stops, like mid-dance. She goes, you know what? She goes, you're kind of fun. She was like surprised by that, which was very offensive for me. But I realized, looking back, she was putting herself in a position where godly men were. And so there's nothing wrong with that, ladies. Put yourself where they are, but don't initiate as it relates to the relationship. All right, that being said, I want you to notice the bottom of verse 7, though. Where do you pass your flocks? Where do you make it lie down at noon? For why should I be like one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? Okay, what does that mean? So that's a contrast. Whatever she's saying, I'm going to be where you're at. She's saying, but I'm not going to be this. Do you know of any other story where a woman veils herself in the Bible? Yes, Tamar veils herself. She sleeps with her father-in-law. What she's saying here is, look, I'd like to be around you, so tell me where you're going to be and I'll come hang out. But let me tell you what I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be like some hoochie girl who veils herself. So she's got some boundaries. I want to be with you, but, but not in an awkward way. I want to be around you and your friends, uh, but not in a one-on-one, -on -one, this is going to get like emotionally or, or uh, physically intimate sort of way. Beautiful, beautiful picture. Good reminder, by the way, is in, in uh, the book of Daniel, when Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go into Babylon. They, they are, they're in Babylon, and so they're like, look, we'll, we'll dress like you, we'll talk like you, we'll learn your history, but we can't eat this food because it's been sacrificed to idols. So we're going to have some boundaries there. Ladies, it is beautiful for you to say, here's what I'm comfortable doing, here's what I'm not doing, and my recommendation, have those boundaries set outside of the moment. Because if you're trying to set specifically physical boundaries in the moment, you can forget it you're going to go way farther than you wanted to go. So make those decisions ahead of time. That seems to be what she did. And so 
Um, I make a little note here in my notes. When, when then is it appropriate to begin the dating process? Here's what I told my girls when they were younger. You're way beyond that season of life. I said, here, look, I'll be your ogre. I have no problem with that, okay? So you are officially not allowed to date. Okay, you're actually allowed to date when you're ready. Just write me a letter and tell me who you are, what you stand for, and what you're looking for, and I'll give you the green light. But you can just make me the bad guy so you, it doesn't have to be awkward. So throughout middle school and early high school, a boy would be interested and inter initiate with my daughter. And she'd go, oh, no, I'm not allowed to do that. My dad, which is totally fine. I have no problem with that. Uh, but when there's the maturity there, when you know what you stand for, when you know what you're looking for, then you're ready to take the next step. Now, some people would say that's overkill. Why the fuss? Here's why the fuss. Because there's nothing more exhilarating than a healthy relationship. And there's nothing more devastating than an unhealthy relationship. And no disrespect to a 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old, my wife would say your prefrontal cortex is not even fully formed yet. You don't know how to operate in wisdom yet. No offense, but it's true. And therefore, allow the people in your life that are an authority in your life to be the wisdom with you while you're gaining in that maturity. Does that make sense? And so that's why we, uh, we have a little overkill. Let's define date. What is a date? First thing I would say is a date is a noun. I went on a date, which means it's a thing. It's not a bunch of things. It's a date. And if a date is a date, and that means we're just hanging out, we spent some time together, um, we were in a public place, it was kind of a one-time event, it was not emotional, it was non-escalating, it was non-physical. Um, we just went on a date, two people enjoying company, it's casual, it's relaxed, it's fun. Is, is it okay then, if that's the definition of a date, for me to go on a date with her, and then her friend, and then her sister? Yes, it's totally fine, because we just went on a date. Now guys, you might want to pick up a second job, because bring your wallet. Because if you make her pay, you've missed the point. So, fellas, dating is expensive. So choose wisely, all right? But the point is, if it's a date and it's casual and we have the right definition, then it changes the way dating sort of should flow. Let's watch this couple spend time. Verse eight, she asks the question, she gets the answer. Verse eight, daughters of Jerusalem speak. Someone read that there. So she share, or, uh, the daughters of Jerusalem share the location. Here it is. I'll send it to your phone. So now she's got the directions. So she's now going to meet with him. And in verse 9, he speaks. One of you gentlemen, read verse 9, will you? Now, we need to remember this is poetry, right? So what does it mean that she is the mare among the chariots of Pharaoh? I don't think it would work, fellas, for you to go, hey, you're a horse. I don't think that's what this means. It means that of all of the, the horses in Egypt, the mare that pulled Pharaoh's chariot stood out as distinct. And what you're going to see is a pattern where this guy acknowledges her as being different than everyone else around. Now, it's not manipulative. He's not working the angles. He's simply affirming her. And if you look, in fact, at verse 10, that language is beautiful, is it not? Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of beads. One of the things that has happened in our loss of manhood is that men have lost the ability, not simply to initiate, but to initiate with kindness, with vocabulary, uh, with an artistic flair. And in that, I think it's something I'd love to see us bring back. And so the, um, the words, the language, it's kindness there. The daughters of Jerusalem in verse 11 affirm this relationship. We will make for you ornaments of gold with beads of silver. And one of the things you'll see, and I'm going to give you two points about dating now. One is this couple dates in community. So the daughters of Jerusalem are present and actively involved in this relationship. So they date in community. Have you ever seen someone who's like a magician? when it comes to a dating relationship, meaning they're with you and your homies and you guys are hanging out and then they meet somebody and all of a sudden they're gone. You're like, hey, where's so-and-so? They're like, well, he met Billy and so he's with, she's with Billy. It's like, okay, well, what the heck? We used to be friends, now she's with Billy. What happened And she disappears? And she'll hang out with Billy um, until Billy breaks up with her and then she's gonna come back, I'm sorry, and now she's back with the girl tribe again, right? 
Proverbs 18.1 says, uh, he or she who separates themselves seeks their own desire and quarrels against all sound wisdom. And so uh, if you are in a relationship, one of the best things you can do is date in community. So date and keep your friendships, keep your relationships. Why? Because friends have the ability to see blind spots that you might not see. As your heart starts going towards someone in a relationship, love covers a multitude of sins. And I use that word very cautiously. I don't recommend using that word in a date context. Um, way, it's way too intimate for a dating context. But, but your heart begins to go somewhere. You'll, you'll develop a set of blinders. You can't even see it. Uh, but your friends do. And by the way, if your friends are like, hey, um, I saw you spending time with homegirl, but dude, are you sure? Because I, I saw homegirl with him the other night. You know, like, you're like, oh no, it's, they're just friends. But if I'm a real friend, I go, hey, look, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. I think you don't see something. That's what community does. And so you want to make sure, first and foremost, you date in community. Now look back at chapter 1, verse 12, just for a second. Tell me where they are physically in 112. Do you see it there? At a, at a king's table. It's translated couch. Table is a better translation. They're at a table. Look at chapter 1, verse 17. Where are they there? What are cedars and cypresses? What are cedars and cypresses? Trees. So that, are they in a house? Are they in a forest with trees? Seems like they're in a forest with trees, right? Surrounded, but their house is cedars and cypresses. Look at chapter 2, verse 4, just for a second. We'll get there in a little bit. Where are they then? They're at a banqueting hall, okay? If the first principle was date in community, the second principle is date in public. Date in public. When... Um, when a couple uh, would come to me and, uh, you know, they've been dating, but they cross physical boundaries. So they're coming, they're a wreck. They know they've messed up. I just met with a couple, my goodness, last Thursday, messed up. I go, hey, tell me what happened. Well, this happened, that happened. We crossed some boundaries. Okay, where were you? Always in pub or in private, always. It's always, we were at my apartment and my roommate was gone. Uh, she came over to the house. My parents were out of town for the weekend always in private. You know what's never happened? Oh, we fell. We crossed more boundaries or uh, physical boundaries. I go, oh, that's terrible. Where were you? And they go, Starbucks. I just, I mean, it must have been the Frappuccino. I don't know. We, we were at IHOP. We were at IHOP. He got the blueberry pancakes. Next thing you know, we're on the floor. I mean, that's never, ever, ever happened. And yet, for any of you who have crossed physical boundaries, I want you to rewind the tapes and ask the question, where were you? Guarantee you're in private somewhere. Or back of a car somewhere in some sort of supposed privacy. By the way, ladies, if, if you ever are dating a man and he insinuates that he wants to get with you in the back of the car, kick him in his face and break up with that guy. That is so classless. Uh, guys, we got to be better than that. That being said. So date in, in public, okay? My wife and I, when we started spending time together, we lived in Denton, Texas. If you've ever watched Walker, Texas Ranger with Chuck Norris, that's filmed in Denton, Texas. So they have a county courthouse in the downtown, and it's got one-way streets all around it. And I did not trust myself to steward that relationship well. And so we met at the Denton County Square. I would put a blanket out there, and in front of God and the entire city, we would hang out. Because I didn't want to get intimate. I didn't need privacy. I just wanted to hang out and have a conversation. We get an ice cream. We'd go to Rama's and get a coffee and then go sit out there and talk. Meanwhile, her friends would drive by, beep, beep, and they'd wave, you know. And then a couple minutes later, you hear a horn honking and one of my buddies hanging out the window, swinging his shirt off, you know. Aah! But we were in public and we never struggled physically in public. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so verses 12 through 14, watch what happens now. While the king was at his table, my perfume, she's speaking, my perfume gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a pouch of myrrh, which lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of En Gedi. Let me tell you what's happening here. As she's reflecting upon this man, something's happening in her heart. Notice it's fragrant, it's sweetness, it's life-giving, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. And in verse 13, most men have no concept for what this means. Ladies, you just need to know, we're Neanderthals, we don't... We don't understand this. 
what this verse means is, girls, you went on a date with a boy, and let's say it went, it went really well. And you're like, man, I kind of like that kid, you know? And so when you come home, you're thinking about it. And you're replaying the tape. Like, wow, he, we did this, and, and he bought my dinner. And wow, it was awesome. And we had a great conversation. It was so natural. Like, golly, your heart is starting to go there. All night long, you're thinking about him. Or at least the concept is you're thinking about him beyond the moment. Fellas, not necessarily the case. Not necessarily the case. So we went out. We had a great time. We come back home. Our boy's playing Xbox. We're like, all right, I got next. And we're playing. How was the date? It's cool. And you're playing. We're working on it. Okay, we're working on it. But this, this text shows us that her heart is going somewhere. Here's what you need to understand, fellas, and this is critical. Take that scale of 0 to 10. Zero being what's your name, 10 being let's have babies. Um, after getting married, of course. If, if, you, if you in this relationship are at a three, she's at a five. That's what this verse means. If you're at a five, she's at a seven. If you're at a seven, she bought a dress. She's got a Pinterest board. She's, she's starting ideas. She's got a binder. She's keeping your notes in a shoebox in her closet. She is farther along. If the stereotype plays out, she's farther along than you are, which is why you have to lead well. Because if you, in the dating context, are talking about, I've always wanted to meet a girl like you, or you said, hey, I promised the Lord I wouldn't date for six months until I met my wife, and it's four months in and you took her out, all of that sends messages that you're way down here. And if you're way down here and she's into you, you put her in a very vulnerable place. And so that's really what this verse is saying. Guys, you have to steward this and handle this well. Notice verse 15. The man speaks. He says, how beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves. I want you to notice what he sees and comments on and what he doesn't see and comment on. He's not eyeing her up and down. He's not googly-eyed over her. He's talking about her eyes. What do they say about the eyes? The eyes are the what? The gateway to the soul. He's, he's looking at her. He's making contact with her. By the way, in our context, you know what I read in this? He's not on his phone. I was at uh, dinner with my daughter, kind of a daddy-daughter date. We were in Palo Alto for some reason, volleyball tournament, and there was a group of about eight young ladies at this table. This is this nice French restaurant, and eight young ladies, and all eight of them were on their phone. I go, girlfriend, that's what I'm talking about. Look at that. That's what I call Peyton. I go, girlfriend, look at that. She's looking at that. I go, they're on their phones. This guy sees her. Keep your phone in your pocket. You don't need it. Okay, you're with her. What's more important than being with her? Show her the honor that she is due. Yeah, your boys are texting you. Who cares? They'll be there when you're done with dinner. Give your full attention to her. This guy sees her. Her eyes are beautiful like doves. Okay, verses 16 and 17. Um, somebody read that there. One of you ladies, will you read that there? Notice how she responds to this kind of leadership. He is handsome and he is pleasant. Guys, when's the last time you've been accused of being pleasant? I, I hope that if you haven't been, you really find an opportunity to be. How do you be accused as pleasant? Well, fellow chivalry is not dead, not yet. So you open that door for that young lady. You open that car door for that young lady. If you pull up to the house and honk, you're not gonna get my daughter you're going to get me, and I'm going to be pissed, okay? You come to the door. You shake the dad's hand if, you're, if she's still at home. You buy the meal. She's going to want to get the salad because she's thinking, I don't want to be too expensive or what? I don't want to be bloated. You tell her, sweetie, you can get the appy. You can get the steak. You can get a dessert. You can get whatever you want. I'll take care of it. Now, you might, again, have to hit pops up when you get home for some cash, but the point is you take the initiative. All right? You walk her to the door. No, you don't need a kiss. It's the first date. You walk her to the door and you say, hey, I've had a wonderful time with you. Thank you so much. And you walk away and you treat her with kindness. And she will walk inside. She will squeal. Ah! Her roommates will come over. What happened? What happened? What happened? She'll give the play-by-play -play of everything. He handed me the salt. He gave me the salt. I mean, that whole thing will go down. Why? Because you treated her the way God called you to treat her. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, don't look at the text. 
What did she think of herself in chapter one? Don't stare at me because I'm sunburned. My, uh, my mother's brothers were angry, or mother's sons rather, were angry with me. They made me caretake of the vineyard. I've been able to take care of my own vineyard. Very self-deprecating, right? One of you ladies, look at chapter two, read verse one. One of the ladies. Like out loud. Say, say it again really loud. Yes. I, my Bible says, I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. Okay, question. Has anything physically changed with her? Because like two seconds ago, she's like, eh, I got, kind of don't look at me. I'm self-deprecating. I got nothing going. But in chapter two, verse one, she's like, ah. right? What's changed? Has anything physically changed? No. What's changed? The presence of a godly man in her life. Good rule of thumb, ladies. If in a dating context, he doesn't make you feel better, you got the wrong guy. Okay? In a dating context, fellas, if you don't lift her up and exalt her, you're not ready to date. This woman sees herself now in a whole different light. He affirms it, verse 2. He says, like a, a lily among the thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. He's like, you are distinct. There's just something about you that stands out that is beautiful and refreshing. And listen to her in verses three and following, talk about the care of her man. Like an apple tree among the trees of of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. In his shade, I took great delight. I sat down and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He has brought me to his banquet hall and his banner over me is love. Now, do you see the imagery of life giving here? As she's reflecting on this guy, and we don't know, first date, second date, we don't know. What we do know, she's like, wow. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. He provides for me. He gives me nourishment, sustenance, shade, safety. Um, She goes on, in his shade I took the lightest fruit, was sweet to my taste. He's brought me to the banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. This is a beautiful picture. I can tell when a couple, a young couple walk into our church, I can tell how he treats her by her countenance. And there have been times where this beautiful girl is with what I'm considering to be a loser because she's walking in like this, you know, kind of holding his pocket, like where he goes, she goes. She can't make eye contact. She can't go be with her friends. She can't do anything but be there and make him look good. That's nonsense. He doesn't treat her right, and it shows. This woman says, he's brought me to his banquet hall, and the banner over me is love. When you and an army would go to war, you'd have a banner, and that banner in the midst of chaos, you'd look, you'd go, okay, there it is. We're still safe. We're still in the fight. That's a good thing. The banner over her in public is love, which means it looks like this. They come in together, and he's like, all right, I'll see you, babe. She goes with her girlfriends, and he's over with his friends, and you'll see him catch eye contact, like, oh, I see you, you know? And they're, they're, but they're working the room together. He's not so insecure that he makes her stay with him. He frees her to go be with her friends. By the way, If you ever date a boy, sorry guys, I'm picking on you tonight, but ladies, if you ever date a boy or a man who doesn't allow you to go be with your friends, you got the wrong guy. Because that means he's got jealousy issues and he's trying to control you. Instead, you should find a guy who's confident enough in his own skin. And guys, we got to grow in that, right? Confident enough in his own skin. You're like, girl, go do you. Also, I'm I'm leaving here in in like 30 minutes. So I'll see you in 30. No problem. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, verse 5 is out of context. Verse 5 is like an ambush until you understand what's happening in her life. She says, sustain me with raisin cakes and refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. May his left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, we do know that raisin cakes and apples, any fruit really with seeds in them, were known as aphrodisiacs. And if you look at this text, I mean, it's pretty graphic. May his left hand be under my head, his right hand embrace me. That is an intimate posture. Like, fellas, if my wife was here, she's a hugger. She'd want to hug all y'all. And and I'm totally cool with that. I would prefer the side hug, okay, just out of respect. Um, I'd prefer you not come in for the full frontal. If you did, I'd prefer the hip out. I mean, just, again, out of respect. But if you reached up and grabbed her by her neck, I'm, like, obligated to fight you in the moment. You know what I mean? (laughs) Because that is a really intimate position. So what's happening here? You've got this godly girl who's saying, may his left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me. 
is this okay? Like, what's, what's happening here? Guys, you need to remember, again, that scale. She's moving that way. And by the way, oh, that was disgusting. <laughs> I just saw two scruffy bearded men, like, anyway. Um, she's moving towards intimate, which means, fellas, you've got to steward that really, really well. You've got to be mindful of that. Now, verse 7 is absolutely critical. Is it okay for a girl to have these feelings? The answer is yes, it's okay. The question is, what are you going to do with them? What are you going to do with them? Verse 7, I want you to know, he speaks. It's one of the most important pieces to understand. He speaks. And I think a lot of translations miss this. My Bible, in fact, says this is the daughters of Jerusalem. I don't think so. I think it's him. And listen to what he says. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hinds of the field, that you do not arouse or awaken love until it pleases. This is this man in the moment going, mm, thank you. Really sweet that you would think like that about me but I'm going to go no on that because the time is not right. Don't arouse or awaken love until it pleases, until the time is right. And he steps up. Now, why is it important that he steps up? Well, the, for the same reason, ladies, that it's really important that you date a man because if you date a boy, he may not be able to quote verse 7. You need to be able, you need to, be able to find a man who has the discipline, the fortitude to quote verse 7. Why? Because from a physical standpoint, women are like uh, crockpots and men are like microwaves. Here's what I mean by that. A man sees a stimulation of some sort, an attractive woman. He responds physically, he sees it, the stimulation leaves, he moves on. Okay, he's just visually, he's responsive. So I've, I've had to explain to my wife. She goes, hey, did you notice that girl? I said, of course I noticed that girl. I notice every girl but I'm not lingering on the notice. I'm taking my thoughts captive, I'm bouncing my eyes, I have eyes only for you. But yes, of course I noticed. If I said I didn't notice, that's not being honest. I noticed, but I'm not interested, okay? That's a man, he sees it, he, he's done. A woman is like a crock pot. Do any of your parents cook with crock pots? So I had a stepmom, her name was Joanne. She was around for about a year, and she was Italian, and she cooked with a crock pot. I'm fairly confident it's a form of torture because she would cook spaghetti sauce for like three days. And I'm like, for the love of God, can you feed the boy, right? Just feed me. But it was amazing, but it took forever to cook. But here's the thing about crock pots. They slow cook, they take forever, but if they're gonna boil over, okay, let's say you've got water in there and it's now hot enough, it's gonna boil and boil over. You can unplug it, it's still gonna boil over. You can take the lid off, it's still gonna boil over. Why? It took a long time to get warmed up, but once it's warmed up, it's hot. Now. Without being too graphic, you need to understand God made us very differently. So if in a dating situation, ladies, you are in a place where you're saying, may his left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me, you need a man who would say, oh, not right now. It's the wrong time. Um, because once you get to that place, uh, you're going to boil over. And here's the thing you need to know. Men intuitively understand that. And so the conversation goes something like this. One thing's leading to another. You're starting to cross boundaries and you don't feel comfortable with it, ladies. So you say, no, stop. He goes, you're right, you're right, I'm sorry. Let's pray, I'm so sorry, can we pray? And then the next night, he's doing the same thing and a little more. And you let him go a little farther. And you go, no, I said, stop. He goes, you're right, you're right. You're totally right, we should pray about that. Let's pray, yes, you're right. And then the next night, he goes a little farther. And what he knows is, intuitively, he may not be able to articulate it, what he knows intuitively is at some point, you won't say no. So he keeps pushing. Or at some point, he'll push you far enough, he got what he wanted anyway. And so that's, that's what's happening here. One thing's leading to another, and he shuts it down. Three problems, by the way, with premarital intimacy, premarital physical intimacy. Remember I mentioned last night, I'm frustrated when we say don't have sex until you're married, but we don't, un we don't articulate why. Here's three problems with a relationship that's sexual in nature. And I want to just say sexual because I'm really not thinking about emotional or spiritual in this moment. It's really sexual. Three problems. One, it atrophies communication. Have any of you ever uh, blown a knee? You blew your knee? Really bad. Okay, so you, you got ACL, MCL? Okay. So that sounds awful. So you put the brace on, okay? What happened to your your leg that wasn't hurt. 
it probably got ginormous. What happened to the leg that got hurt? It probably shriveled away to about nothing, right? That's what it means to atrophy. If you are in a relationship that has premarital sexuality, it atrophies communication. You don't need to communicate, you just make out and everything feels better. And so it, it, it in some ways hinders the very thing that you need to have a healthy relationship. You don't build a marriage on sex. You don't build a healthy relationship on sex. You build it on the ability to communicate, which means the most important muscle to flex is the ability to articulate what you're feeling. And if you're making out or having sex or oral sex or, 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 then you are literally atrophying the number one thing that you'll need for a healthy relationship. Second is it gives you the illusion of health. The illusion of health. So in a relationship that's sexually intimate, it always feels better than it actually is, especially in the moment. It's always going to feel better than it is especially in the moment. So it gives an illusion of health. With that, by the way, you'll find that it's the law of diminishing return. So um, you, you hold hands for the first time and it feels like a thousand volts go through your body. But in three months, you don't feel that anymore. You mess around for the first time, you're like, oh dude, that was crazy, we shouldn't do that, let's do it tomorrow. And then you wanna do more. It's law of diminishing return, okay? So it gives you an illusion of health. Third thing though, and this is the most critical, it's harder to get out of a bad relationship. So we can start talking ourselves into all kinds of stupid because we've already crossed the boundary. And so we say, well, we've already crossed the boundary. Maybe we should just stay in it as if somehow if we get married, then it, it makes right what we've done. But two wrongs don't make a right. And by the way, if you're crossing boundaries in a dating relationship, what makes you think you're not going to cross boundaries in a marital relationship. And you say, yeah, but we're married. No, I'm not talking about him and you or her and you. I'm talking about him or her with somebody else. Because they've already demonstrated to you they have no self-control. They have no boundaries. They have no biblical standards. Because in a quote-unquote godly dating relationship, you're messing around in the backseat of a car or crossing boundaries. You've demonstrated who you are by way of your character. A ring changes nothing. You see what I mean? A ring changes nothing. You're still the same person. You just wore a white dress. You're just wearing a ring. But you're still going to struggle with the same issues. So how, how, do we, how do we handle all of this? I go, look, I want you to understand the feelings of verse 5 are not bad. It's just the wrong context. So take this fireplace, by the way. It's a perfect example. So if I took... That wood, which by the way, I heard the guys out there chopping wood, well done. If I took that wood, that wood, and I put it on this couch, and I put some lighter fluid on it, and I light a match, what's going to happen? That thing's going to blow up. It's going to be hot, a little naughty. We're like, dude, that's crazy, right? But then, but then uh, it might spread to that one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and these beams. And next thing you know, it destroys everything that we hold dear. Why? Because that couch is not meant to handle that heat. It's not the right context. If I take the same wood and the same lighter and I throw it in that fireplace and apparently have a leaf blower that blows the cold air out, forget about that. But anyway, I put it in there and I light the fire in there. What's going to happen? It's going to be wonderful and glorious and warm this whole room. What's the difference? Context. It's just the context. So did God create a proper context in which we can enjoy the flames of sexuality? Yes, and it, it's not on the couch. It's in the fireplace. It's not in a dating relationship. It's in a marriage. And as you enter into a marriage, a marriage has the proper context of faithfulness, of commitment, of exclusivity, of exchanging of vows, of a promise till death do you part. And that context was meant to handle this heat. Let me close with one thought. For some of you... Um, you may be thinking, well, this would have been nice to have known this three years ago. Um, and, and if that's you, I, I want to give you a little bit of hope in this. Um, you may have already crossed emotional boundaries. You might be thinking of a breakup right now going, dude, I was 0 for 3. I did all three of those. Or you might be saying, oh, man, I, I was okay with one, but the other two, regardless. But, but you've, you've already given yourself away. 
And if that's you, I, I just want you to understand, that's why we have a Savior. That, that's, why, that's why we have a gospel that meets us in our brokenness. And the only thing worse than being there is being there again. And so take whatever you've got left, like I did, and just say, you know what, never again. Until I'm married, never again. I will not, I, I made the commitment, I will not tell a girl I love her. Uh, I will not give a red rose and I will not kiss another woman until I'm married. Not because I was godly, because I was honest. I wasn't sure I could hit the brakes. I wasn't sure I had the 2-7 maturity. I wasn't sure I was that guy. So I just said, I'm taking what I've got and I'm going to hold and see what happens. And I will say this, God is a very gracious God. He will meet you in that and he will make old things new. And if you'll confess to him where you've been, if you'll own where you've been, walk in light as he is in the light, you'll have fellowship with one another. Amen? So, let's change the way we do relationships. Now, it's a high standard, all right? But Romans 12 says, do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If the dating situation currently was working, I wouldn't waste your time. But I think it's leading us into catastrophe. And so there's got to be a better way. I think there is. That's another install. That's dating. Tomorrow we'll talk about seriously dating and move forward with what happens when a date, singular, becomes dating, plural. How do the rules change? We'll get to that tomorrow. Cool? All right, let's pray. God, thank you for your word that speaks to these issues of passion and desire that you've given us. And the passions and the desires are not bad. But the living out of those passions and desires, God, you've created a context and to live those out outside of the proper context can be catastrophic. And Lord, many of us live in the charred remains of what could have been. But God, we cross boundaries. And so thank you that you meet us in our brokenness, redeem us. And Lord, would you give every one of these students hope that there's a better way. And so Lord, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.